My name's Charlie Liverman. I consider myself an auditory neuroscientist. I've been interested in the study of hearing and hearing loss for uh, almost 50 years now. When I began as a graduate student, uh, my advisor suggested that it would be interesting to use overexposure to loud sounds as a tool to study the auditory system. Overexposure to loud sounds uh, damages primarily the inner ear. And the inner ear is where sound evoked mechanical vibrations are turned into electrical energy that then goes to the brain. That's how we hear. And that transformation from mechanical vibration to electrical energy is done by the sensory cells and the nerve fibers. The sensory cells turn mechanical vibrations into electrical signals and the nerve fibers take those signals to the brain. Many years ago, we and others had noted that if you exposed an animal to a loud sound that might cause a temporary loss of hearing sensitivity but would eventually recover, We always knew there was some nerve damage after noise, but the conventional wisdom was that it all recovered. And the reason that it took so long to figure it out is that what disappears first are these tiny connections, we call them the synapses, between the sensory cells and the nerve fibers. So if the synapse blows up, retracts, dies back, which is what we believe happens, that nerve fiber now is completely cut off from the world. And those are very difficult to see in routine tissue specimens that one would typically look at. And the key to discovering this phenomenon was um, having antibodies that allow us to see at the light microscope level, which is much easier. Once we could do that, it just became immediately obvious that there was tremendous synaptic damage, tremendous loss of these nerve connections after a noise exposure, leaving the rest of the nerve fiber intact, which is actually very important when thinking about regeneration and possibly the ability to get the nerve fibers to regrow and reconnect to the, to the hair cells. We gave it the, the term synaptopathy, cochlear synaptopathy. A key piece of the synaptopathy puzzle uh, arose from my interaction with my collaboration with Sharon Kajawa, former student of mine, director of audiology. In addition to studying animal models here at the Mass Eye and Ear, we study um, autopsy material from humans. As far as we can tell, all of us, as we age, start losing these synaptic connections. And in a study that we published recently, we showed that by age 60, the average person had lost 40% of these connections. And some had lost 60% and some had lost 80%. So we know from work that I've been doing for the last 20 years with a collaborator named Gabriel Corfas that um, a class of molecules called neurotrophins is normally released in the inner ear and it's critical for the survival of neurons. And indeed, in a mouse model, we showed that enhancement of the levels of neurotrophin in the inner ear can both prevent the damage from happening in the first place and uh, recover it if given within a certain time window after the exposure. The longer it's been after the exposure, it gets more and more challenging. I think as uh, gene therapy uh, proceeds as it is on many fronts, I think the next frontier is going to be applications like this, either bring back synaptic connections that have been destroyed or keep them from disappearing in the first place as we age. So uh, it's a promise for the future at this point in time. My wife Leslie has been working in the Eaton Peabody Labs for almost as long as I have. She is hugely responsible for my progress over the years and really particularly with respect to synaptopathy.
As with any modern biomedical research lab, the real engines that drive it are the trainees. So we're lucky in this environment to have um, lots of trainees around, and they're the ones who, who really drive the research forward. I've been doing very basic research for years and years and years, decades. You know, I started out being interested just in how normal hearing works, but being in a hospital environment as I am here and being surrounded by clinicians and people with hearing impairment, I naturally became more interested in deafness and curing deafness. It's very rewarding, satisfying for me to think that all this puzzle solving I've been doing over the years might actually uh, bear fruit and, and lead to the development of therapies. That would be very satisfying, very exciting. <laughs>